Good evening, Jesus Image Church. We'd love to just welcome our online family. Thank you guys for joining us. I just want to read out of Psalms 107. It says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. I don't know about you guys, but I'm hungry for a touch from the Lord. And I just felt this strong sense that none of us have to leave the same tonight. That if we come with a heart knowing that we're coming to worship the one true living God, if we set our hearts to just look at Him, we don't have to leave the same tonight. So Holy Spirit, we invite you. We invite you, Lord, make Jesus real to us tonight, that we would worship Him rightly, that when He comes into the room, we would be a people that responds to Him. Jesus, you are welcome, and we worship you. You are the only one worthy, Lord. We love you, Jesus. You are welcome. There is a sweet anointing in the sanctuary. There is a steel. the song tonight can you sing that for just a moment
and lay down the burdens you have carried for in the
joy because Jesus is here otherwise we're just making noise <laughs> but the King of Glory is in the room tonight and where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom where he is the Lord there is liberty I believe he is Lord of all he is the Lord in this room tonight does anybody believe that so why not be filled with joy in his presence why not be filled to overflowing joy. There is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. His presence makes the difference. Somebody receive joy tonight. Yes. Receive joy. Let the joy of the Lord fill this room. Let the joy of the Lord fill this room. Joy
We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive. In the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive. Yes, sir. We come alive in the river. We come alive. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We come alive.
no one, no one, no one, no one, no one, no one. So we pour our love on you, God. We pour our love on you. Just pour your love on the Lord. Lord, holy is the Lord. 
You're holy. You're set apart. You are other. You are different, Jesus. Father, we love you tonight. You are King and you are Lord. Emmanuel, God with us. You're with us. <laughs> we thank you, Jesus. God, thank you week after week that we get to come into the presence of God and worship you with you. We love you, Lord, in your precious, beautiful name. Come on, church, let's love them. Let's give a shout of praise to the King. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Holy One of Israel is in the room with us tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's thank our, our worship team and our choir tonight. Love you guys. Amen. You guys can be seated in the presence of Jesus. I get the joy and the honor to receive tonight's tithes and offering. Yes. Come on. This is worship to Jesus. This is worship. If you guys want to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to read out of verse 5. This is the New Living Translation. It says, Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Come on, how many of you know we know that scripture? Hey, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. What's wild is right before that says, do not love money. How many know in Timothy, the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. But it says, do not love money. Be satisfied with what you have. And then he goes on to say, for I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have him. We have the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We find satisfaction and content in Jesus Christ, that he is with us. You know, ultimately the means in which Jesus Christ was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane was 30 pieces of silver. It was money. You know, Judas walking with Jesus, he found his satisfaction in being content in money, not knowing that the one who is the treasure in the field, capital T, was with him. The one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, that owns the earth and the fullness thereof. That's where our true contentment and satisfaction is found in Jesus Christ. That we have him, man. And if we have him, we have everything. See, money's not the root of all evil, but the love of it is. We can't love money and him at the same time. Amen. We're a church that loves Jesus. And he gets the very best. And we find joy and we can cheerfully give to him. Because our, content, our satisfaction isn't found in the money in which we're putting into the offering, but into the hands in which we're putting our offering into. It's Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that we get the honor week after week, the honor of giving into your hands. Jesus, our satisfaction and our content, being content is found in you and you alone, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for giving to us long before we can ever give to you. We really do give into your hands tonight. God, we pray that you bless every giver in the room and every giver watching online. Lord, we thank you that you're blessing businesses and families and jobs. Father, we thank you for favor with God and with man. We love you, Lord. In your precious, beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to bring the buckets up here. If you guys need an envelope, we have ushers throughout the building. Just raise your hand. We'll get an envelope over to you. We have our text to give on the screen as well as for you guys watching online. There will be a number on the bottom of your screens. You guys can text that number. Um, and we love you guys. Come rush the buckets. We'll be back in a few minutes.
much to welcome a father and a true friend to this house. The entire Brevere family has not only impacted my life and my family's life, but has truly blessed our entire Jesus Image Church family. So if we can just stand and honor Pastor John Brevere as he comes up here. So, we grew up in the same neighborhood together. Everybody stay standing. How old were you when we were in the same neighborhood? I was a baby. You were a baby. Yeah, I was a baby. You were like this big. I was a little you baby. Now I have going, a baby. You have a baby. That's not fair to me. <laughs> it's so good seeing you. Hey, good evening, everyone. What absolutely absolutely amazing worship <laughs> wow do y'all just come out here just to worship and then you tolerate the preaching is that what you do <laughs> i'm joking i'm joking my that was just so good that's so amazing and it's so good to be here my dear friend michael and jess have been just so precious to lisa and i and we're so proud of what you guys are are doing and will continue to do your family, so godly, and uh, of course, just as dad, I honor him so deeply. Um, I wouldn't be the man I am today had it not been for Pastor Benny Hinn. And uh, I love this city. Uh, Lisa and I lived here from 1987 to 1999. Uh, three of our sons were born here. The sons are now 35, 32, 31, and 27. It's hard to believe. So um, just just really good to be back and uh, such a precious precious atmosphere in here tonight how many of you how many of you really believe that we're on the verge of one of the greatest moves of god the earth has ever seen i believe that i just think covid was kind of a forced sabbatical before the greatest move of god on earth You know, COVID caused a lot of people to retreat, withdraw, pull back. But Jesus said, occupy until I come. <laughs> and so the church's position is we're continually on the offensive. It might change the way we do things. The way we administer things may change. But we're going to be on the offensive. And nobody's going to stop the church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I just really have something very, very strong in my heart for you tonight. I really believe it is a prophetic word. And I really don't want to take a lot of time introducing. I, I will show a quick picture of my family. I will let you know that Lisa and I are, we're heading into 40 years of marriage this year. Do we have a picture? There they are. Uh, 40 years of marriage. I have, um, I have a marriage goal, my number one marriage goal. Would anybody like to know what my number one marriage goal is? That the day Lisa Bevere leaves this earth, she will love me more than the day I married her. Oh, leave the picture up. The number two marriage goal is the day I leave this earth, that I will love her more than the day I married her. Now, when you set goals in, like that in your life, believe me, God will back you up. But you'll run into speed bumps, but at least they won't be walls. Do you understand what I'm talking about? A wall is when you say, I can't go any further. But when you've got that kind of a goal set before you, you just say, all right, we're running into a little situation here. It's a speed bump. You see the difference? Amen. And then my number one ministry goal, number one, is that when I leave this earth, I will love Jesus more than when I started ministry. Amen. Amen. So... We have four sons. All four of our sons have worked at Messenger International for years. Messenger International, we've got about 50 team members here in the, in the United States, and we've got over 1,000 team members around the globe. Um, we've got, um, oh my goodness, Addison and Julie are on the left. They have four children. Those are their four children. 
And then we've got next to me uh, is Alec in the white shirt. He is dating an Australian right now, and we're very helpful. I'm not going to say any more. Uh, we've got Austin and Jess, and Jess's dad has been a board member of our, on our board for years. And then we've got on the very end, Arden and Christian, Arden and, or Arden and Christian. And I do need to say that um, we did have another grandchild, and she was born in July. And this is, her name is Sophia, or Scarlett, excuse me. Show, show us Scarlett, there she is. <laughs> Look at those eyes. She's like, I know what you're doing. You can't hide it from me. She is amazing. And then we found out that we have another one on the way. So, six, um, six G babies. And you know, the more I love my family, the more I realize how much God loves us because we're his big, massive family. Can you say amen? amen? How many of you believe that God can change your life completely and totally in one service? Anybody believe that in here? Seriously, do you? Yes. Then put up your other hand. I could be the best communicator on the planet, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't anoint these words, we're just going to get information. And we need transformation. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I believe that you don't have because you don't ask. So we're going to ask God to change our lives forever. Amen? amen? I mean, your life already should be changed after that worship, but we're going to ask him to do it through his word. Amen? And what else he wants to do in here tonight? So Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne. Lord God, I step into that place of authority that you've called me to serve your people. And I'm asking, Holy Spirit of God, that you would manifest in this auditorium tonight and in our lives tonight and in all the people's homes online tonight and that you would do what you love to do the most and that is that you would reveal Jesus to us in a way like we've never known him before. And as you do that, may we go from strength to strength, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. And I'm asking this, Lord God, because I know your kingdom has come. Your will shall be done. In this earth tonight, in this place, on earth as it is in heaven. And for this we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise, and the thanksgiving. And it's in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome, magnificent name we pray. And everybody that agrees shouts. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise for what he's going to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Amen. You can be seated. So tonight I want to share with you out of the, the newest book that I've written called X. <laughs> yeah, I got a bunch of millennials that work for us. That's the title of the book, big X on it. But anyway, I wrote this book and it was finished being edited right when COVID started. And I remember going to God and I said, God, why would you have me write a book like this right when COVID was going on? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, son, I've always given you prophetic messages for the time period that the books come out, not the time period you're writing them. And I thought, okay, I'm good with that. So the book has come out. And I want to say that I really believe it is a prophetic word for the church right now. How many of you know that as believers, it is very important that we are established in two things? Number one, who we are in Christ Jesus. How many of you know this, that the Bible doesn't say someday we will be sons and daughters of God. The Bible says, beloved, now are we the sons and daughters of God. Just as you have never seen a thoroughbred racehorse give birth to a mouse, even so God does not give birth to unworthy worms. We are princes and princesses of the king of the universe. We are created in his exact image and likeness. And as he is, the Bible says, so are we in this world. The second thing that is equally important that we are established in is what we are called to do in Christ. Jesus makes this statement in John 434. I want you to look at these words carefully. My food, my food. Do we have that? Can we put that up so people can read it? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
Jesus later says in John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, so now I am sending you. So what does that mean when you put those two statements together? Our food is to do the will of him who sent us and to finish his work. Now, what does food do? It strengthens you and I. Can you imagine going 10 days without any food and then trying to do hard manual labor? You're not going to do very well. Even so, I would have to say in over 40 years of walking with Jesus, the number one reason I see people backslide is because they disengage from what they're called to do. What happens? They get weak and they then become vulnerable to temptation. Our food is to do the will of him who sent us and to finish his work. So to open this up, let me just share a story or two. About seven years ago, I was in California. I was getting ready to speak at the LA Dream Center. One of our partners, one of our passions at Messenger International is to give resources to pastors and leaders overseas that cannot afford it. And one of the partners that had significantly helped us saw that I was coming to the Dream Center. He asked me to go play golf at Riviera. I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. After we played golf, we were driving back to the hotel and he said, John, can I be vulnerable with you for a few minutes? I said, sure, absolutely. And he said, as you know, I've worked my tail off for the last three decades of my life and my businesses are now doing extremely well. My net worth is well over nine million. He said, my wife is cared for life. My children are cared for life. He said, I just turned 50 years of age. He said, my question to you, John, is why should I work these next 10 years, the decade of my 50s, as hard as I have worked the past three decades? Now, I knew this was a moment. And I knew that the words that I was going to speak was going to shape this man's life for the next 10 years. And, I, and rather than just giving him an answer off the cuff, I looked inside and I said, Holy Spirit, I need something right now. And the Holy Spirit gave me an answer. And I said, well, Stan, I want to answer your question with, my, with a different scenario. I said, as you know, I've written 17 books. At that time, it was 17. It's now 22. But I said, I've written 17 books. They're in over 100 languages. They're in the multi-millions all over the world. I said, I have gotten on planes. I have flown over 12 million miles. I've been to 60 nations. I have stayed in little 400 square foot hotel rooms for as many as 229 nights a year away from my family. I have eaten some of the craziest foods. I have encountered some of the most different cultures. I have fought jet lag. You know, my wife's cared for life. My children are cared for life. Why should I get on another plane? Why should I write another book? And he laughed at me. He laughed at me. You know what he said? He said, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes when you face Jesus. And I said to him, Stan, you just said the exact same words. And I remember the little smirk left his face. He took his eyes off the 405 downtown LA. And he's a little upset with me. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, Stan, God has placed a calling on every single believer's life. And I said, to accomplish that calling, he has given us unique supernatural giftings that enable us to fulfill that call. And I said, we can do one of three things with those supernatural giftings. We can use them only to build ourselves, our family, Secondly, we can use them as intended to build the kingdom. Or third, we can just sit on them and do nothing. I said, now the problem we have here is you have connected my dots, but you've not connected yours. I said, you see how my gifts of writing, leading, and preaching are being used to build the kingdom. The problem is you've not connected the dots of how your gifts are building the kingdom. And I said, to be honest with you, Stan, your gifts are actually more important than my gifts. He said, where do you get that from? I said, the Bible says the parts of the body that are not seen are more valuable than the parts that are seen. I said, I have a seen gift. You have an unseen gift. Yours is more valuable. Six months later, he called me. I said, Stan, how you doing, buddy? He said, you want the honest truth? I said, yeah. He said, I have been haunted in a good way. Every single day the past six months by the words you spoke to me. I said, well, what are you doing about it? 
He said, I'm busting my butt. And that was the language he used. I'm sorry. He said, I'm busting my rear end to build my businesses up to 35 million so I can give more in the kingdom of God. Well, I got a text from him about five months ago and he signed the text, $70 million stand. I have another friend who pastors a church that has 35,000 members in it. Every year he does a leadership conference. And he was walking through his sanctuary the day before the leadership conference. The conference was sold out every year. And he sees a very well-known medical doctor in his city putting pamphlets on every saint in the sanctuary for the delegates that were coming in the next day. Now, this doctor is really well known in his city. And my pastor friend rushed over to the doctor and said, Doc, 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 you don't need to do this. We got volunteers and interns that are doing this. And the doctor rebuked my pastor friend. And he said, Pastor, he said, I take one week a year off my medical practice so I can help build the kingdom of God. Please don't take this away from me. Now, I've wept over this. I literally was doing a podcast, told the story and started weeping. Because for 51 weeks a year, that doctor sees himself in the secular, working and earning a living. One week a year, he gets to be in the sacred. For most Christians, they see their 90 minutes in church on Sunday, their 30 minutes of quiet time on a daily basis as being that time when they're in the sacred, but all the rest of the time, they're in the secular, they're earning a living. I have news for you, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you are in the sacred. So in order to really bring the message that I wanna bring to you tonight, I've gotta establish three words. Will you give me a little time to do that? I wanna go to Romans, the 12th chapter, the sixth verse. Paul the apostle makes this statement. He said, having then gifts differing according to the grace, everybody shout grace, Grace. that is given to us, let us use them. Now, the first word I need to establish is the word grace. Now you're probably, if you're a believer in here, you say, I'm well established in that word. Well, we discovered a few years ago that most believers are not well established in that word. The Greek word for the word grace is charis. A few years ago, a nationwide survey was done. Over 5,000 born-again, Bible-believing, church-attending Christians were polled. In this survey, a question was asked to these over 5,000 believers. Give three or more one-word definitions of the grace of God. Now, the overwhelming response was this. Salvation was the number one answer. A free unmerited gift was the number two answer. Forgiveness of sins was the number three answer. The love of God was number four. Now, I am so glad that Americans, American believers understand that we are saved by grace and only by grace. And that you cannot earn it, you cannot merit it, and it is by the grace of God our sins have been forgiven. Thank God. But here's the tragedy of the survey. Only 2% of the over 5 thousand believers said that grace was God's empowerment. Yet this is exactly how God himself defines his grace. He said to the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9, and if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, these words are in red. These are not Paul's words. They are God's words directly. He said, my grace is all you need. Now look at this, for my power, for my power. What is his grace? His power. Works best in your weakness. What's your weakness? Your human inability. So God defines his grace as his empowerment, yet only 2% of the Christians in America understand that. The apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, grace be multiplied to you as his divine power has given to us everything we need to live a godly life. So Peter, the apostle Peter, defines grace as God's empowerment, yet only 2% of the Christians understand that. If you look at the Apostle Paul, he says, I did more labor than all the other apostles, yet it was not me, but it was the grace of God in me. He defines grace as God's empowerment. So my definition of grace, after years and years of studying every single verse of Scripture in the New Testament on grace, is God's empowerment that gives you the ability 
to go beyond your natural ability. Write that down. It's really important that you get that. The grace of God is God's ability or God's empowerment that gives you the ability to go beyond your natural ability. Now, let me tell you something. I know something about your calling. How many of you would like to know something more about your calling? Let me see a show of hands, okay? Okay, I know something about your calling. What is it that I know for sure? I know this for sure about your calling. It is impossible for you to fulfill what God has called you to do in your own ability. Now, how do I know that? Because God said, I will never share my glory with anyone. So if God would have made what he created you to do on this earth capable of being accomplished in your own ability, then he'd have to share the glory with you. So God on purpose made your calling beyond your natural ability so you'd have to depend on grace to fulfill it. Now here's what's really scary. You cannot have anything from heaven unless you believe. You can't get saved unless you believe in believing grace, right? You can't get healed unless you believe, right? You can't have anything from heaven unless you believe. And you cannot believe what you do not know. So if 98, let, let, let me say it like this. If, two per, if only 2% of the Christians in America know that grace is God's empowerment, that means 98% of the Christians in America are trying to fulfill what they've been created to do in their own ability. What do you call a human being's body that 98% of it doesn't work? An invalid. Do you ever wonder why so many millions, billions of dollars has gone into the gospel and yet we're not accomplishing what we should be? Other countries are accomplishing so much more with a much smaller budget. Sure is quiet right now in this Methodist church. Are you still here? <laughs> All right, let's go back to Romans 12:6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Now, um, you guys need to go forward because there's, I repeat it again. This time I need the word gifts highlighted. If you just punch the buttons a few times. All right, there we go. All right, if you take the Greek word grace, which is charis, and you put an M and an A on it, what do you get? You get charisma, correct? That is the Greek word for the word gifts. Now, what is the definition of the Greek word charisma? It is this. A specific gift of grace that empowers an individual to fulfill what they've been created to do. All right, so what would be one of the charismas on my life? It'd be writing. Now, what most of you in here probably don't know is that my very worst subjects in high school were English, creative writing, and foreign language. I'm not kidding. It used to take me about four hours to write a two page paper. I'd go through half a notepad. And remember, we didn't have, in my high school, we didn't have iPads. Okay, I'd go through a half of, the, of those notepads before I'd even get a few paragraphs out. If you think I'm kidding, do you know what I scored in the SAT? In the English, you know, there's an English ver part of the SAT and there's a math, right? I scored 370 out of 800. Let me help you understand this. In all my travels, I have only met two human beings that scored lower than me on the English on the SATs. <laughs> And one guy, because he guessed at all the answers, he was so mad at his family for sending him that Saturday he wanted to play sports. <laughs> so when God came to me here in this city in 1991 at 5.30 in the morning, I was outside at a construction site praying. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And he said, son, I want you to write. I said, okay, you have so many of us kids now on the planet, you're getting us confused with one another. You don't want me to write, just talk to my English teachers. Now, I took his silence as an agreement to my rebuttal, so I didn't do anything. Ten months later, two women come to me from two different states in the United States within two months of each other, and they both said the exact same words. They said, John Bevere, if you don't write what God's giving you to write, he will give the messages to somebody else, and one day you'll stand in judgment for it. Now, when the second woman said those words to me from the state of Texas, two weeks after the first woman from Florida, the fear of God hit me. And I remember tearing out a notebook piece of paper and I got a Sharpie and I put contract on the top of that paper. I wrote a contract with God. I said, God, I think you're making a huge mistake. You have much better writers. I can't write, so I need grace. And I remember I signed the contract. I didn't even know grace was God's empowerment back in those days. And I remember signing the contract. 
And now today the books are in the tens of millions. They're in 129 languages in the world. I mean, in Vietnam, Lisa and I are the most published authors in the entire nation, secular or Christian. I was asked to do a conference in Korea. First time I'd gone. I fly to the city of Seoul. It's a national conference in the city of Seoul. They said, hey, we want to do a press conference before, the con- before you speak. I said, sure. I'm thinking five, six reporters. I walk into this room. There is five different televisions. There's TV lights. Five different television stations are there. There's 32 reporters and the third largest newspaper in the nation. And I remember the first words out of my mouth were, in all these lights, what are you all doing here? And they said, well, your book has been on the top 10 best-selling list in Korea every single month for the last two years. So when I look at these books now, I realize the reason my name's on there is because I was the first guy to get to read them. Because I realize it's not my ability, it's actually his ability that wrote these books. Are you seeing this? Another gift, upon my, another gift in my life would be preaching. Do you know the first time Lisa heard me preach 40 years ago? <laughs> She's sitting in the front row, five minutes into my message. She goes sound asleep and she slept the entire message. <laughs> not only that, no, 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 we're not done. Her best friend sitting next to her. Her name is Amy Storr. She's a pastor's wife in California. She is in such deep sleep, I'm seeing drool come out of the side of her mouth. (laughs) Now I preach to 5,000 people, 10,000 people, 35,000 people. People say, you get nervous before you speak to 35,000? I say, no. And they say, really? Why not? I say, because I know how bad I am. And if charisma, if the gift of God doesn't show up, we're all in big trouble. Are you seeing this? Now, one of the gifts that is not in my life is singing. If I would have been up here singing with this worship team, the majority of you would have left because it could have killed the beauty of it. Are you with me? All right, let's move on. The next word I want to share with you before I can bring the message is this. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. Everybody shout stewards. Stewards. Say it again. Now what is a steward? A steward is someone who manages what belongs to somebody else. You got it? Now, one of the definitions of a steward is this. I'm not going to give you the full definition, but one of the definitions is a steward is never micromanaged. What's a good example of a steward? It would be Joseph in the Bible. Joseph starts out as a slave in Potiphar's house. He ends up as a steward of his entire household. And you know what the Bible says? Potiphar didn't even know what was going on in his household except for the food that was set at his table. He didn't micromanage Joseph. If I look at the guy that manages my 401k, he's some guy out in Colorado, uh, California. He's a nice guy. His name's Tony. Do you know what? I do not call him every other day saying, Tony, what did you do with our funds, leases of my funds for retirement? What did you do with it today? I, I, to be honest with you, he has to chase me down once a year because he's required by law to talk to me once a year. And to be honest with you, he's, I, he's always said, you are so hard to get. I said, yeah, because I'm really not interested. I'm not going to micromanage what you're doing. It's our funds. He manages them, but I'm not micromanaging him. Are you seeing this? So the question now becomes, if Paul says, let a man consider us as servants of Christ and stewards, what are we stewards of? The answer is Charisma. You see, my ability to write is not my ability. It's actually his. My ability to preach is not my ability. It's actually his. My ability to lead is not my ability. It's actually his. You still with me? Now let me show you a scripture that will bring all four of them together, okay? Or all three of them together, all three words. Look at this, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a gift. Now the Greek word for gift is charisma there. Now, notice it says as each one. Notice it doesn't say as each pastor. Notice it doesn't say as each one in the fivefold ministry. If you're born again and you're filled with the Spirit of God, you have a gift or gifts. What are those gift or gifts for? They are God-given to give God-given abilities that He gives 
It gives you the ability to go beyond your natural ability. Now, the problem is we limit these gifts to just operating in the church. No, probably 99% of these gifts operate outside the church. Can you keep, yeah, keep that scripture up. Well, that side's gone. Okay, look at that side. Probably 99% of these gifts operate outside the church. I mean, where do you find the gift of being able to paint the Prince of Peace? Do you know what Akiana painted when she was like eight years old, I think it is, that painting that's worth over a million dollars today? She did when she was eight years old. Where's that gift in the Bible? Where's the gift to be able to remove a tumor? I mean, I remove a tumor from your body, you're dead. (laughs) You're gone. But somebody with that gift removes the tumor from your body, you live. So these gifts are abilities that God gives us to be able to go beyond mainstream natural ability. Are you following me? You with me? So look at this. As each one has received a gift, minister it. Everybody say minister it. Now notice Peter. Peter says minister it. Paul said use them. In other words, we are to be using these gifts. Okay? Minister to one another as good stewards. Everybody say stewards. stewards. So what are we stewards of? Charisma. And you put all the charismas together. Now we lost both screens. You put all the charismas together and what do you get? The manifold grace of God, he goes on to say. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote it again. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So you put all the charismas together and you get the many-sided, many-sided grace of God. Do you see this? Are you with me? Okay, now, here, l- l- listen to me carefully. The gift of God in your life, I'm, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to expose a misnomer, an error that we hold. People think if I'm godly, if I'm Christ-like, the gift of God in my life will automatically work. The answer is no. I said the answer is no. There is no one more godly in the New Testament other than Jesus than this man named Timothy. Paul wrote to the entire Philippian church. He said, you know his proven character. That he's Christ-like. Writes it to the whole Philippian church in the scripture. And yet Paul has to write two letters to him later and say, Timothy, your God-given gift is inoperative. Engage it. So if Being godly, being kind, being forgiving automatically engages the gift in our life. Timothy would have had it engaged to the maximum potential. It was dormant in Timothy. It has to be engaged by faith. What's going on? Talk to me, guys. Do we have, do we lose everything? Is that what happened? Is it gone? Because I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Can we do that? Or else I don't want to do it the old-fashioned way. Go back to, go to your Bibles. All right, that's a good idea, guys. All right. All right, now let's go to the next frame. I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 4. Now, I've introduced the three words. I can bring the message that God has called me to bring to you tonight, okay? Let let me say this. Let me say this. What would happen if 100% of the believers in the church were operating in their supernatural gifts in the world? You know, there's a scripture, Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, that says Daniel distinguished himself among the commissioners, among among the government leaders of Babylon because he, he, he had an extraordinary spirit. He distinguished himself. Now think about it. Daniel comes out of this little country called Israel. He's brought in the most powerful nation in the world. If you try to compare Babylon with America, you're making a big mistake. Babylon's number one in the world in education, in the arts, in science, in military, in the economy. America's like 16 in the world in education. So don't don't compare America with Babylon. Babylon is unbelievable in that day. Daniel comes out of this little podunk country. He and his three friends are interviewed by the king of Babylon, and the king determines they're 10 times smarter, wiser, more innovative and creative than their best leaders in Babylon. Daniel starts coming up with ideas they'd never thought of. Now, can you imagine 
what the other leaders were thinking? We have been trained by the finest scientists, the best leaders, the best teachers on the planet. These guys come out of this little country and they're having all these ideas and they're getting promoted above all of us. Now, if you look at what Jesus said, Jesus said, John the Baptist is the greatest man born up to that day. Which means John is greater than Daniel. Now, don't try to compare the two. John's a minister, Daniel's a government leader, but John's greater. But then Jesus makes this statement. He said, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Which means the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than Daniel. So the question I have is why aren't we distinguishing ourselves? See, my Bible tells me we're the head and not the tail. I've lived in Colorado for 22 years and I've never once seen an elk tail leading its head. But yet the church constantly looks to the world for inspiration. The world should be looking to the church for inspiration. It's amazing to me. (laughs) Look at what Jesus said. Let your light shine that men may see your good works. Not hear your good scriptures. See, what am I saying? I'm saying if you're an ER nurse... You should be coming up with ways of saving people's lives. It's causing all the doctors in the emergency room to scratch their heads going, where she's getting these ideas from? We have far more training than her. Where is she getting these ideas from? Charisma. If you're a third grade, school te- a third grade, third grade public school teacher, you should be coming up with ways of communicating wisdom and knowledge to your students. It's causing the... The other teachers, the principal, the superintendent, to all scratch their heads going, where's she getting these ideas from? Charisma. I could go on and on, but the problem is we limit it to the church. God intended for us to be the head. So people will say, how is it that you do these things? Your light shine that men see your good works. Well, let me tell you about it. But yet we limit it to within the four walls of the church because we're in the sacred when we're in the church, but when we go out to work, we're in the secular. Sure is quiet here. Is it just because you're listening? Okay. All right, so look at 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ. Let's, let's punch the button. Go, go. Yeah, there you are. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. Everybody shout stewards. Steward. Everybody say, I'm a, I'm a steward. What are you a steward of? Charisma. Hey, let me stop it. Let me, let me, let me talk. You know why I have the three dots there? Because Paul talks about his specific stewardship. That he carried a message from heaven. Okay, do you know what Paul said about his specific specific stewardship? He said, woe is me if I don't operate in it. Do you know that you can't pronounce any higher judgment in Scripture than saying, woe is me? Now, why did Paul take it so seriously? Because if he doesn't operate in the gift that God entrusted him with, the people that God intends to get What God has to give them through him won't get it. See, my gift to preach is not for me. It's it's for you. My gift to write is not for me. It is for you. And you know, happy is the man or woman who knows their gifts and operates in them. Miserable is the man or woman who tries to operate in somebody else's gift. Would it be really weird if when I woke up this morning... My thumb said, you know what, Mouth, you've been preaching for 35 years. I'm going to preach to Jesus' image tonight. What am I doing? I'm frustrating you. And who else is getting frustrated? My thumb. See, when you try to operate in somebody else's gift, not only do you frustrate all the people around you, you frustrate yourself. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen right now. 
All right. Let a man so consider us. And now I can bring the message to you, all right? I've given you the introduction. I can bring the message. And, and, and relax. The message will only take 15 minutes. <clears throat> Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. Everybody say, I'm a steward. I'm a steward. Shout it. I'm a steward. I'm a steward. What are you a steward of? Charisma. Charisma. Moreover, it is required in stewards. Now look at this. That one be found what? Faithful. Come on, say it. Faithful. Shout it. Okay, I have stood before leadership groups for 10 years and I've asked leadership teams all over the world. I'm, I'm not just talking church leadership, I'm talking business. I'm, and I've asked these leaders, I've said, give me your definition, your one word definitions of faithful. And I have gotten some great responses and I compiled a list because I don't want to take the time to do it tonight. Let me show you the list that I've come up with. Steadfast, consistent, dependable, reliable, loyal, true, trustworthy, devoted, and truthful. And you know what? I'm so proud of these leadership teams. Because if you go to the thesaurus, you will find all these words in the thesaurus as synonyms for the word faithful. Here is the tragedy. In 10 years of talking to leadership teams, I have never heard one leader give me probably one of the most important definitions of faithful. And do you know what it is? Multiplication. You say multiplication? A definition of faithful? Yes? Multiplication is not a definition of faithful. Go to the Noah's Webster's Dictionary. Go to the source. The source you won't find multiplication. Well, that's sad because Noah Webster followed Jesus and he should have known it because Jesus defined faithful as multiplication. You say, where, where, wait a minute. Where did he do that? The parable of the talents. Now, I want you to look at this like you've never read it before. <clears throat> Jesus tells this parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants. Everybody say his own servants. So we are not talking about outsiders. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about work inside the kingdom, right? He called his own servants and delivered what? His goods to them. So he is making them managers with full authority over what belongs to him. <clears throat> now, what does this guy give them in the parable? Talents. What is a talent? It's not a talent like I can sing or I can play an instrument. A talent is a measure of money. If you really want to know the truth, what Jesus is talking about is bags of silver, actually pretty big bags of silver, okay? So I'm going to personalize this, this parable, okay, to make it a little more realistic. So I'm going to say that Ashley gets five bags of silver or five talents. Or let's say it correctly. What does Ashley really get? Five charismas. Because how many of you know when Jesus tells a parable, he's never really talking about what he's talking about. <laughs> I mean, he uses seed for the scripture. He uses wheat for good people, tares for bad people. He is not talking about bags of silver. What are we made stewards of? We have shown you through the scripture. What is it? Charisma. So Ashley gets five charismas. Dave gets two. And if your name's Larry here tonight, no, no identification intended. <clears throat> Larry gets one, all right? Now, this master goes on a long trip, and Jesus emphasizes long twice in this parable, signifying once again that a steward is not micromanaged. Boy, do you need to hear that. After a long time, Jesus said, the master returns. And he says, I want you to give an accounting of what you did with my goods, my, tal my talents, my charismas. Correct? <clears throat> Ashley and Dave come forward and they said, Lord, we multiplied what you entrusted to us. Ashley said, I made my five into ten. Dave said, I made my two into four. Look what the master says to Ashley and Dave. Watch this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, if Jesus stops right there, we cannot equate faithful and multiplication. We cannot say multiplication is the definition of faithful. However, look at the next three words. You were faithful. There is no other action. There is no other virtue described in these two servants other than the one fact that they multiplied. 
Jesus didn't say they were kind, they were patient, they were steadfast, they were immovable. He doesn't say that. He said they multiply. That's all he said. And I believe he did it on purpose because he wanted you and I to understand that a definition of faithful, a primary definition of faithful is to multiply. You were faithful. You can't slice this pie any other way. He directly equates multiplication as being a definition of being faithful. It's a good place to say amen. <clears throat> over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things, enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, you got Larry. What did Larry do? He was given one and he maintained it. He didn't lose it. He maintained it. What does the master say to Larry? Then Larry who had received one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Problem number one, he doesn't understand the character of his father or of his master. <clears throat> and I was afraid. This is the number one reason the gifts of God in our life will not operate. Fear, intimidation, timidity. I was afraid. I was timid. I was intimidated. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Now I want you to see what the master says to him. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Not you wicked and lazy outsider. This guy is in the kingdom. Now how many of you know Jesus never uses words carelessly like we do? And I remember when I saw this one day, I said, hold on a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. You just called him wicked. So I need understanding. And I, I went searching and I found answers. First of all, let me deal with lazy. That's an easy one. The definition of lazy means to shrink from or hesitate to engage in something worthwhile. Okay? What does the word wicked mean? It means this, possessing a serious fault and consequently being worthless in regard to our labor. So what does this tell us? God views those who multiply as good and faithful. God views those who maintain as wicked and lazy. I've got my nice little business. I show up to church on time. I'm faithful. I would run that definition through this parable. I'm not going to do it. You do it. When you hear faithful, you should hear multiplication. You should not only hear steadfast, consistent, dependable, reliable, faithful, true, devoted. You should hear multiply. Still here? It's going to get worse. Next verse. So take the talent from Larry and give it to Ashley who has 10 talents. So wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Lockdown Larry starts out with one talent and ends up with zero. Ashley starts out with five talents and ends up with 11. Now one day, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Let, let, let me back up a little bit. I'm going to tell you how all this started. Well, well, it's not fully. I'll tell you later how it started. But this is part of how it started. So I'm in prayer five years ago. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. I hadn't read this parable in months. And I'm sitting at my desk. My Bible's open in front of me. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And he said, son, the way I think is actually more capitalistic than it is socialistic. Okay, don't you dare walk out of here saying John Bevere said God's a capitalist. That's not what I said. God made a statement. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. What he said to me, listen to what he said to me that morning. Or yeah, it was that morning. He said, son, the way I think actually lines up more with capitalism than socialism. And I remember, I said, 
Uh uh. Uh uh. I am not saying that from a platform. There's no way, especially in election year, and it was an election year. I said, I'm not saying that unless you show me in scripture. So he spoke to me, he said, go to the parable of the talents. And I went over the parable of the talents and he said, can I show you what the hypothetic socialistic thinking God would have done? I said, okay, what would he have done? And he spoke to me what he would have done. He, this is what he showed me. He said, would he give each of them three? Would he give an Ashley five charismas? Dave, excuse me, Ashley three charismas, Dave three charismas, and Lockdown Larry three charismas. <laughs> now, Ashley and Dave would have been faithful Larry would have been lazy and wicked. So what would have happened? Ashley and Dave would have ended up with six. Larry would have maintained his three. Then the hypothetical socialistic thinking God would have taken one from Ashley, one from Dave, given it to Larry, so they all ended up with five. (laughs) Ashley ended up with 11. And Larry ended up with zero. Listen to me, church. God never said, take care of the lazy. He said, take care of the poor and needy. There is a huge difference. Oh, wait a minute. He did say something about the lazy. He said, they're not even supposed to eat. Don't feed them. Now, we're not talking about somebody not saved that's lazy. We're talking about somebody in the kingdom that's lazy. Don't even feed them. Don't give them food. I didn't say it. Paul said it. (laughs) Don't look at me like that. Still with me? This totally changed my paradigm. What was God's first commandment to mankind when he puts them on the earth? Be fruitful and multiply. He wasn't just saying have babies. He was saying anything I entrust to you, return it back to me multiplied. (laughs) Jesus is just amplifying that original first commandment that God gave to mankind out in a parable called the talents. Oh, it gets worse. It gets even worse. I'm not kidding. It gets worse. Look at the next verse. Jesus goes, for to everyone who has. Okay, let's read this in context. For to everyone who multiplies, more will be given, and he or she will have an abundance. But from him who maintains, even what they have, it will be taken away. You know, I shared with you earlier how I couldn't write in high school. I mean, I barely passed English every year. And then God comes to me and says, I want you to write. Right? And then there's this book I write, the third book, and it's called The Bait of Satan. And it explodes. It's it's sold almost two million copies now. It's sold that much. And I remember I, I'd, I'd go and I'd, I'd stand in front of 10,000 people and preach on the bait of Satan. And I get one chapter out of it. And I'm so frustrated because I watch 9,300 people leave the auditorium without the book. And 600 people leave with the book. And the reason I was frustrated is because I preached one chapter in that book. And I didn't tell people, like, in that message, how to stay free from offense, how to, you know, let the offenses fall. And so they were leaving with a partial message. And I'm sitting there going, God, this is so frustrating. Now, God will use frustration to give ideas for multiplication. So God said, come out with a curriculum. Put 12 lessons in the curriculum, teach chapter by chapter, and then have some education company come up with the student manuals and the teacher manuals. I thought, man, that's brilliant. That's, that's. So I went to my board. My board said, oh, churches don't want that. I said, look, man, I just know God's put it in my heart. They said, well, then do what's in your heart. Well, 
within a few years, over a million of those curriculums sold. I mean, tw- over 25,000 churches in America were using them. People were using them in their Sunday school classes. They were using them for their Sunday night service. They were using them for their connect groups. They were just exploding. So May 31st, 2010, it's Memorial Day, right? Lisa's in England doing a women's conference. It's Memorial Day. I just played a round of golf. I come into the house. I go, I, I, you know, my boys are gone. The house is empty. I think, I'm just going to go down and read the book of Daniel. I don't know why I read the book of Daniel. I just feel like reading the book of Daniel. And all I can say is this. I have the book of Daniel open, and all of a sudden, my entire basement fills with the presence of God. I mean, so thick, I'm almost shaking and thinking, don't you dare move or say one wrong word in this presence. That kind of presence. My entire basement's flooded, and I'm sitting there trembling, and I hear these words so clear. I I hear them like you hear me speak right now. I hear these words. You have been faithful with the English-speaking community. I want you to get these messages I've entrusted to you into the hands of every single pastor in the world that can't afford them. I'm sitting there shaking, and I'm thinking, okay, Zacharias, because I'm sitting there, my mind's going, what, every pastor in the world? And I'm thinking, Zacharias said that about John the Baptist, and he got struck dumb for nine months. Don't say a word, John. But the interesting thing to me was, he said, you have been faithful because I took the books and multiplied them, the messages in them, turning them into curriculums, hiring 17 members that called churches and serviced them, right? He said, you've been faithful. He said, now I want you to get your resources in the hands of every pastor in the world can't afford them. I'm like, oh my gosh. What? So I walk into our director's meeting a few months later And they're giving me the yearly report. And I said, how many books did we give to pastors overseas last year? And my international director opens up and goes, we gave 33,000 books to pastors overseas last year. And he's all excited. And I said, that's pathetic. (laughs) The whole room went quiet. And I said, this year I want to give away 250,000 books to pastors all over the world. And the whole room goes like silent. Lisa said she tasted throw up in her mouth. (laughs) And my COO argues with me for 20 minutes. And finally, I just slammed my fist down. I said, we're going to do this. Well, you know, that year, do you know what happened? That year, we gave away 271,700 books to pastors and leaders in 54 nations and 46 languages. The next year, it went to 1.3 million resources. The next year, it went to 2.7 million resources. The next year, it went to over four. The next year, it went to over five. It Now, every year, we give in between six and eight million physical resources to pastors and leaders. And now we have given them away in 228 nations of the world and 116 languages. How do you do that? Physical resources. In Iran alone, we've given away over 2 million physical resources, 24 translated books, 14 translated courses in Farsi. In Arabic, we've given 22 books and 12 courses in Arabic to the Arabic speaking world. How do you do that? Charisma. There's no way I could have ever done that. My COO argued with me for 20 minutes. But what am I saying? To him who has, let's read it in context. To him who multiplies, more will be given and he or she will have an abundance. God said, you multiplied, you were faithful, multiplied with the English speaking world. I want you to get your resource in the hands. Then in 2018, I'm frustrated because we had business people. Our international director took our business, our business people that had given significantly, took them to Myanmar, took them to Cambodia, took them to Vietnam, took them to Mongolia. And, and this one businessman looks at me and he goes, John, We drove eight hours into the middle of nowhere in Mongolia. There's this white tent. I go in. It's a church. He said, they have the Driven by Eternity book. They had had it given to them in Mongolian one month earlier from us. He said, already 10 people had read it. And there were people waiting in line to read it. He said, the book looked like it was 10 years old. Because see, we have books on our shelves. They have nothing. Okay? They beg for the crumbs that fall from our table. Okay? So... 
I'm sitting there going, man, nine people had to wait for that one guy to read. Then there were other people that couldn't read. And I'm getting angry, right? I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, this is not right. Then they tell me, in China, in the underground church, because we've given over a million resources there, they said, they tear the bait of Satan into 15 pieces, 15 chapters, and they give one to everybody, and they memorize it, and they each preach it the next week, over the next 15 weeks. And I'm like, this is wrong. This is wrong. So 2018, the Holy Spirit gives another idea. See, what, what does he do? Out of frustration comes divine inspired ideas. So the next year I go, so 2018 I go, let's develop an app. I don't wanna give them a rinky dink app. I wanna give them a Mercedes app. That's what I said to our partners. I said, we're gonna give them a Mercedes app. So one of the best app developers in the world, they've done Lush, they've done L'Oreal, they've done Maybelline, they've done Royal Caribbean, they've, they've done the U version. They, they heard about it and they, they flew up to Colorado and they said, hey, We hear you really want to do a good app. I said, yeah, I do. They said, we want this account. What do we need to do to get it? He put his best designers on it for a year and a half and two and a half million dollars later, fully paid for, out comes the app and it relaunched one year ago today. And already in one year, listen to this, in one year, the app is in 116 languages. It's the first app in the world that has over 100, actually over 80 languages on it. So in one year, it's already been downloaded in 223 nations in the world, in 14,988 cities of the world. It has exploded. The company that works for Peloton, they, they, they do the Peloton, they do others. They're called Contentful. They did a big portion of it. They said, we've never seen an app launch like this. So they've done a case study on it. What is this saying to you? This is saying to you when you use your God-given gifts to multiply, more will be given to you. You say, you're putting a lot of pressure on me right now, John. Then you're not getting any, you're not getting any part of the message. You're totally missing the message. The disciples got so frustrated one day, they looked at Jesus and said, what do we do to do the works of God? Jesus said, believe. (laughs) I am not putting pressure on you mentally or physically. I am putting pressure on your faith, on your heart of faith. (laughs) Another man, a man named Mike Rogers, a good friend of mine. I called Mike three times to make sure I had the details correct. Mike was saved when he was 11 years old. At the age of 35, listen to this carefully, and I'm going to close with this story. The age of 35. Hey, man. I can't preach and do music at the same time. It's my fault, not yours. I admire preachers that can do that. I can't. I'm just warning you. I didn't tell you. I didn't meet you before. Okay. Totally my fault. Okay. All right. So anyway. But I'll tell you, I need you, okay? All right, so stay with me, because we're going to pray. God's going to do something in here tonight. This is, this is really cool. Okay, so, so listen to this. At a, Mike gets saved when he's 11 years old. When he's 35, this is his exact words. He said, I got fed up with being a fruitless Christian. That's what he said to me. I said, what'd you do about it, Mike? He said, I memorized 2,000 scriptures in six months. Smart guy, sharpen the axe. Cut down more trees. Remember the wisdom of God sharpening the axe. In that six months, he went to a conference in Phoenix. It was Pastor Tommy Barnett's conference. There were 5,000 people at the conference. Mike said, John, I was so broke. I had to stay in a two-bedroom apartment with 11 master's commission students. That's how broke he was. He said, Pastor Tommy got up and said, I want everybody to pray about what you're going to give in the offering. He said, so I did what Pastor Tommy said. I went and found a cactus outside and got under the cactus and said, God, what do you want me to give? He said, I heard the Lord say, I want you to give $200. And he said, my rebuttal was, God, that is every penny to my name. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to Mike? Mike, I'm not asking you for any more. Some of you will get that in a few hours. (laughs) He gave every penny to his name in that offering. He said, John, I had to bum gas money just to get home. He gets home and God starts giving him ideas. This is the way multiplication happens, divine inspired ideas. God gives him ideas. He starts implementing the ideas. He's not lazy. He's actually a worker. He starts making money. God challenges him and says, 
the Lord said to him in prayer, he said, I want you to give $100 above your tithe every single month. So he gave $100 above his tithe every single month. The next year, God said, I want you to give $400 above your tithe every single month. So he gave $400. Next year, he said, I want you to give $1,000 above your tithe every single month. So the next year, he did $1,000. Next year, it went to $1,500. Next year, it went to $2,000. Next year, it went to $2,500. Then it went to $3,500. Then it went to $5,000. The next year, it went to $10,000 every month above his tithe. And then he said to me on the phone, this is hilarious. He goes, then it kicked in, bro. <laughs> I said, dude, I said, it's already kicked in in my book. He said, the next year, John, it went to 17,000. The next year, it went to 25,000. Next year, it went to 35,000. Next year, it went to 40,000. Next year, it went to 50,000 every single month above his tithe. The next year, it went to, no, not the next year. He said, eventually, it went to 100,000. And he said, it, then it went to 150,000 every month above his tithe. I said, Mike, how much do you live on? <laughs> He said, you know, it's really interesting that you asked me that. He said, this has been like 22 years of doing this now. He said, my accountants just recently told me they've watched my books all through the years. And he said, they told me I live on, listen to this, 10 to 15% of my income. So he gives away 85 to 90% of his income. He's a kingdom builder. What's his gift? Giving. See, there are so many different gifts I believe the Bible didn't list them exhaustively, just like the Bible didn't list every single one of our spouse's names. But the fact of the matter is, you have gifts. You may have one, you may have two, you may have five, you may have seven. The question that is the most important question is not what do you have, is are you multiplying them? Every single one of us will stand before Jesus and will answer to him on what we did with what he entrusted to us. His ability that he entrusted to us. I want him to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. That's what you want to hear him say. Remember, it is important that we know who we are in Christ and what we're called to do. Because my Bible says we're saved by grace, by faith, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us to do in advance. We are not only saved by grace, we were equally empowered by that grace to do what God prepared for us to do. <clears throat> Did you get something out of this tonight? Did you get something out of this tonight? I want every head bowed, I want every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for what you've done tonight. We're so, so grateful. Holy Spirit, I'm so grateful. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for speaking to us. And thank you for the lives that are about to be changed. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I don't want anyone moving around. I want you to really listen to me because the most important words I've uttered tonight are about to come out of my mouth. You can never really multiply to the degree that I've been talking about unless you have an authentic relationship with your Creator. I think one of the greatest hindrances to people getting an authentic relationship with our Creator has been the sinner's prayer. We tell people, if you pray that sinner's prayer, you're right with God, but the sad thing is people can pray it without ever repenting of the lovers that are in their heart. The Apostle Paul made a statement. He said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife. He said, the two become one. He said, this is actually an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. 
God gave us an illustration that we see on a daily basis. A man and a woman being joined together to become one to illustrate how you and I can have an authentic relationship with him. So let's talk about it. When a woman walks down the aisle of a church with a white dress on, in front of all of her friends, and the wedding march is playing, what is she saying? She's actually making a pretty strong statement. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. She's saying this is the one and only man that I am giving my entire heart and life to for the rest of my life. I will never engage with another relationship with a man in a romantic level and I am breaking off all former romantic relationships. Jesus is called the groom throughout scripture. We are called the bride. He is not coming back for a bride that has given him 80% of her heart and still has other lovers hidden away. A bride who flirts with the world and gets in bed with the world. He's not doing that. He's coming back for a bride that has given herself to him the way he gave himself to her. If you look at it, it absolutely astounds me. I have been meditating on this so much lately. But Jesus, I can't even imagine yet, neither can you, what he left to come to this earth to be rejected, to be despised, to be spit on, to be punched in the face, to have every bit of his beard plucked out, to have thorns thrust into his head, to have a a lead-tip whips struck across his back, to be beat on, to be crucified. And he's our creator. He did it because he gave himself 100% to you and I because we're his bride. If you think you can just pray a sinner's prayer and sleep with the world and come to church, you know, you may come to church because you know, man, that's a good feeling when I come in there. Man, there are nice people in there. I don't know. You may say, I'm a really good person and I come to church and I pray to prayer. Well, you know what? You can be as good, you can be as good as anybody in this city, but that's not going to get you a relationship with God. It's giving your entire heart to him. When Lisa walked down that aisle 40 years ago, she gave her entire heart to me. Was she perfect the first week? No. Was she perfect the first year? No. Was she perfect in the 40th year? No. Believe me, I'm way less perfect. I've made a lot more mistakes, but I'm talking about a bride right now, not a groom. But you know, one thing that's never changed, she gave her heart to me and she has never once, never once, given it to another man. Some of you in here tonight, you know that you haven't given him all your heart. Even as I'm speaking right now, you realize it and you're a little nervous about it. Don't be nervous. This is only the Holy Spirit trying to draw you in to an authentic relationship because that's how much God loves you. That's how much he loves you. So if you're in here tonight and you'd say, John, I mean, look, you can fool the person sitting next to you, but why in the world would you ever want to fool yourself, especially on a matter that deals with not only this life, but all eternity. If you're sitting in your seat right now and inside you're going, truth be told, I have not given him my entire heart and life and I want to do it right now. And I want to give you an opportunity. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand up. I want to pray for you tonight. Just raise your hand up and let me pray. Wow, look at the hands going up. Put them up high. Listen, no bride's ever been ashamed of her groom. Put them up really, really, really high. You know what I want you to do? Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. Stand to your feet if your hand's in the air. Just stand right there at your chair. Stand up right there at your chair. No, 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 no. Everybody else keep your heads bowed because there's still people deciding right now. Some of you are sitting there right now going, I don't know about this. I don't know if I want to do it. Let me ask you, please, 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 just make a decision. Let me tell you why. Because right now the Holy Spirit is gently nudging you. And the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. In other words, you'll leave this service and you won't feel that nudge any longer. And the next time it will be harder for you to hear because your heart will be harder. 
if you feel that nudge and you know you haven't given him your entire heart, then just count the cost. Do what the bride does. She has to decide, okay, I'm, I'm breaking up with Aaron. I'm breaking up with Jim. I'm breaking up. I, I'm not going to see, I'm not going to see Dave anymore. She makes that decision. Make that decision right now. And if that's you and you say, yeah, I'm willing. Cause let me tell you something. God will protect your right to go to hell forever. If that's what you really want to do. If you don't want a relationship with him, he will protect that. He will make sure that that free will stays intact, but you will be separated from him forever from all the source of life and you will be in utter solitary confinement in darkness in a lake of fire forever that's not because he did it he died for you he didn't want you to suffer so if there's anyone else there are a lot of people standing but i want to make sure there's no one left i'm going to give you one more opportunity to stand up right now just stand up quickly if that's you if there's anyone else I just want to make sure nobody's missed. Anyone else? Okay, those of you that are standing, I want you to do something. I want you to break up with those lovers. Break up with them right there in your seat. Break up with them right now. And I want you, once you break up with them, I want you to head down to the front. I want to shake your hand. I want to pray for you to receive Jesus. And I want everybody else to give them the biggest hand. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, man. Hey, what's your name? Stay standing. Stay standing. Stand up. Hey, come here. Stand up. Come here. Come here. What's your name? I'm so proud of you. Come here. I'm so proud of you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Give me a hand. Come on. Come on. I'm so proud of you. Come on. Give me. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Hey, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on in here. I'm so proud of you. Hey, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. You too. Hey, come on, give him a hand. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And you. Come on, come on. And you. And you. Come on. Hey, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, sis. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so proud of you. Hey, come close. Come close. Why do you guys have sad looks on your face? This is like the greatest decision you've ever made. <laughs> okay, now, if you're crying because you're so full of joy and thanksgiving, that's okay. But I've never seen a bride walk down the aisle going, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this. Do you understand? The prodigal, the prodigal son just said, I've been a jerk. I've been so stupid. Turns around, starts walking home, and the father comes running with gifts. Do you, under, do, you, do you understand? Jesus, Jesus, while I was giving this call, was sitting there going, I'm, he had eyes filled with hope, hoping you would respond. Because he'll never force you to respond. He gave you a free will and he'll protect it. He will protect your free will forever because that's what he chose. But he was hopeful. Just, just, just like the girl, you know, she's hoping this guy will call her up and ask her for a date. They met at a social event and she's, she, she happened to get him her number and she's just hoping he'll call, right? Or the guy that's just hoping the girl will say yes to the date. Come on, that's Jesus. He didn't force you to come down here. He was hoping that you would respond to his love. You got it? Amen. So you can put a big smile on your face. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give you a glimpse. Just, just, just close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you. Spirit of God, give them a glimpse. I want you to open the eyes of your heart. I want you to just open up the eyes of your heart right now. His presence is here. Do you see him? Do you see his eyes dancing with joy? Do you see the big smile on his face? Do you see his arms outstretched to you? Do you see the delight in his face? The delight in his eyes? There's his presence right there. Okay, he's here. He 
he's here. He's here. You see him? Now lift up your hands. This is an outward sign of what you're doing inwardly. You're surrendering everything to him. I want you to say this. Speak to the one you're looking at. Boy, his presence is here and you haven't even prayed yet. He's already touching you so deeply. That's his presence right there. There he is. Say this out loud to him. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Let your, let your ears hear your mouth say this. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me for living life my way apart from you my creator I'm so so sorry but tonight that's all changing on this day January 30th 2022 I give my spirit soul and body everything I am everything I have to you Jesus Jesus, you are my Lord, my groom, the love of my life, my king, my elder brother. I'm yours. Thank you for giving me a brand new nature. Thank you for cleansing me. I'm free. I'm healed. I'm whole. Lift your hands up. Now, Father, I'm asking you, fill them with the presence of Jesus. Fill them. Fill them with your spirit. There he is. Just receive right there. Whew. Wow. Now, if you're in this auditorium and you'd say, John, I am a true believer, but I've been maintaining. I've not been multiplying. And I want to ask God for the grace to multiply tonight. I want to, I want to engage the gifts in my life tonight. I want you to stand up if that's you. I want you to put your hand up high. If that's you, wow, wow. Say this out loud. Say, Father. Father. Say it boldly. Father, Father. Your, word states your word states to come boldly to your throne throne. in a time of need need. to obtain grace grace. to help help. so tonight tonight, you place gifts within me me. they've been dormant dormant. but no longer will they be dormant I engage those gifts I I stir them up up. and I'm asking Lord Lord. open the doors doors. that no man can shut 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 the doors that no man can open. And Lord, may the gifts that you placed upon my life manifest and function in my world of influence. And as I multiply, I ask that you would give me more. You promised this, and I receive it. Now keep your hands lifted in the air. Keep your hands. Keep your hands up. called the spirit of grace he's empowering you I see people that there's an impartation right now happening with you there are some of you you've been faithful already and God is giving you more there's been some of you you've awakened to what he's called you to do and I command in the name of Jesus for those gifts to come alive I command them to be engaged I command them to bless a dying and a hurting world. I command them to reveal to a dying and a hurting world the greatness of our God, the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you for what you're about to do. There's his presence right there. There's his presence right there, right there. Just say thank you, Father. Lord, multiply, multiply, multiply. In 
Jesus name oh my my there's his presence there are people being healed in this building right now there are marriages being healed right now Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for physical healing that's occurring all over. Let the fire of God burn in them. Burn out those ailments, those diseases, those sicknesses, those infirmities. I command in Jesus' name. And Lord God, I call, I call in the name of Jesus for Michael to speak again. I command I command you to speak we need your voice no no you're not stopping that voice the gates of hell will not prevail against it no so father in Jesus name may the fire of God burn out anything that's hindering those vocal cords and I thank you for a strong voice stronger than it's ever been Jesus name I see I see a tumor literally dissolving right now I see a tumor you're dissolving in Jesus name I see gross inside somebody's mouth they're going away those gross are disappearing now in Jesus name thank you father thank you for the many that are being healed in this place father in Jesus name give you praise just lift up your hands one more time and just thank him. Come on, thank him. We give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for what you've done and what you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him praise one more time. Hey. Michael and Jess here, we are standing on the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. A local church, Jesus School, a House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that, we believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we wanna invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is gonna do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything, 
the location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus Image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for His presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious, with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary, depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first-year students, as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week, and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. 
It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May He be adored and worshiped on this property. May His Word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May His gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find Him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and His gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.